Aloha, family, and welcome to First Wednesday service. You heard me right. It is First Wednesday, and it is the first Wednesday in the month of December. It's December is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. It's happening. It's right now. And I know it, it came up on us so, so quickly. Uh, I'm so glad you're joining us uh, today, uh, tonight. And, and, and actually, if you are joining us for the first time, dude, shoot out a, a hello, shoot out some emojis, let us know who you are. Even if you've been watching us all the time, come on, I wanna see family, friends, jump in on the chat, say hi, we love you. I'm really, really excited about our time together. Uh, but before we jump into that, family, let's worship. So here's what I want you to do. Whatever the middle of the week has brought to you, wherever you find yourself right now, I want you to set your hearts on Jesus and let's worship. See, you give life. You give life.
Amen, family. Woo, love our worship team. Hey, well, before we jump into the message tonight, what I want to do is I want to jump into a couple of announcements. So first and foremost, welcome, welcome. If you are joining us for the first time, text us. Let us know in the chat again, but text us. 808-670-3377. Text the word welcome, and we'd love to connect with you. Uh, it's a, just a simple way for us to just get in touch, especially if you're joining us online, and to take that online interaction and, and turn it into an actual connection with like real humans. And then that connection then maybe, maybe, it turns into community and it turns into some friendship and we get to walk together and do a little bit of life. Look, we just wanna connect people. Promise you we're not gonna spam you. So text the word welcome to that number on your screen uh, and we'd love to connect. Uh, here's another thing that we got going on. Family, we are in the first week of our Advent series. I hope you enjoyed the message on hope last week. And, and so if you got your Advent kit, which I hope you did, uh, what we can do is open that kit up this week. Every week as we talk about hope, this week's whole theme is unpacking hope. And in your family Advent guide, you'll find a devotion that you can do as a family. And there's an activity for the kids in your kit. It's a little scroll activity that you get to do together. Family, let's find the time to do it. And in fact, if you do it, man, take a picture and email us at ohana at newhopehk.org. Uh, or, or shoots, just text it to, uh, to a small group leader. We'd love to see it. Man, post it on our Facebook page. We'd love to see how you guys are engaging with the Advent Guide. Hey, remember this week, we're coming up and we're talking about love. And in fact, I love that because what we're doing is we are meeting in person. Woo! Yes, in-person service this Sunday at 9 a.m. at Consolidated Theater in the Coco Marina Shopping Center. We want to see you there. We're going to jump in in part two of our Advent series, God With Us. We have two in-person services this month, one on the 5th and one on the 19th both at 9 a.m. So don't miss it because we are gonna be celebrating together and we're gonna be getting ready for our Christmas Eve service. Now, Christmas Eve is again gonna be online. We're gonna have more information in the coming weeks on our online Christmas Eve service, the times, all of that stuff. But one great thing we are gonna have, our Christmas Eve at home kits for you so that we can do it again together, lighting candles, celebrating together, and remembering the reason that we celebrate this Christmas and Advent season. Well, all right, family, there's gonna be more information this weekend and in your newsletter, so make sure you take a look at that. If you have any questions about our gatherings, go to our website. There's a tab on there with all that information. But with all of that being said, we're gonna just pause for a second, take a look at this, and then we're gonna jump in to our message on the last church in the book of Revelation that we didn't do before. We got one more to catch up on. So let's take a look at this and then we'll jump in on it. Family, I know it is the Christmas season, and uh, we just got done celebrating Thanksgiving. Whew! I'm sure that was delicious for you. I'm praying that your time together was full of God's presence and a lot of fun and a lot of family and a lot of laughter. Um, 
I ended up watching just like a few minutes of a football game on uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, many of you, uh, maybe you've heard me talk about how uh, much of a football enthusiast I am. I just know all of the things about football. Not really. But I tried some new things this year. I, I even, uh, I, I'm in a fantasy football league, and, and uh, that, because that's real. That's, a, that's an actual thing. And um, I don't know what's going on at all, at all. But I was, I was, because I was paying attention, and because my league or whatever, and looking at the game, and um, I saw, I looked at these refs, you know, and, and and they're in such a high pressure situation, having to make all these calls, and you know, and I was, I was wondering how much they got paid, and it got me thinking about referees, and it got me thinking about how they have to be so solid in the calls that they make, you know, and and then I I came across this article just a few days later, and it was about how. Football referees are not often the as unbiased as we would all hope. And I think maybe we have an understanding that may or may be true. But there was a study done, a statistics done out of, out of New York, that, uh, that referees were more likely to make calls that favor the team whose coaches and players are on the sideline closest to wherever that penalty was called, okay? So, you know, they have to make so many split decisions and very, very quickly, right? And so it's more likely that, like, things like maybe a late hit or something like that, that if, they, they, if the penalty occurs closer to one team's sideline with all the screaming and all the yelling, regardless of if it was true or not, statistically, referees are more likely to call in favor of that team simply because of all of the screaming and the yelling and the passion and all of the things. Pressure gets results. <laughs> it, it, we would hope that it wouldn't change the conviction, and yet sometimes that's exactly what it does. Instead of being solid in the call, all of a sudden the pressure of all these voices begin to kind of weaken our resolve. And in a moment, maybe we doubt ourselves, and then we just change the call. It can be tough to stick to your decisions in the face of pressure or temptation. And this is exactly where the church of Pergamum found itself. So Pergamum was this incredible city. Now, it wasn't a major trade center. It wasn't uh, like, like, say, Ephesus or some of these other places that had a lot more going on economically, but it had two huge strengths. The first was its political strength and its religious strength. It had two things going for it, politics and religion, right? The things that nobody argues about. As far as politics go, what ended up happening was the Roman Empire or, or established a capital city in Pergamum, it was kind of like the Washington, D.C. of the East. It extended the Roman Empire out into the East. So it was very, very politically solid and strong. And it was strong religiously. What I mean is the Roman faith spectrum had lots of gods and goddesses, many, many things to worship. And so there was a temple for everybody. There was a God for everything. But one in particular was the temple to the emperor. The imperial cult was one of the, was so strong in Pergamum. In fact, Pergamum was, was the first city, one of the, or if not, the first city to have a temple built exclusively for the worship of the emperor. So emperor worship was alive and well in the city of Pergamum. It was a reality that Christians in that city would have to deal with every single day. And it's in this place, and it's in this moment, that John pens this letter to this church, and he says this, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. 
Now remember, Jesus will usually take a title or of description from chapter 1 and pull it into one of these chapters. And that's what he does here. In chapter 1 he says, In his right hand he held seven stars. The picture that John had, seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. Now, biblically speaking, we know this, that the sword represents a couple things. The sword represents power and authority. Power and authority. The sword. And what Jesus is trying to say is, look, I'm establishing that I am the only power and the only authority that you should be concerned with. He is the only one. And it also represented truth. It represented the word of God, the double-edged sword that came out of the mouth of him holding seven stars, right? So it's this picture. It's an incredibly prophetic picture of the truth of God's word proceeding from the mouth of Jesus, rightly dividing truth. These pictures are so vivid. And in the middle of that, what God was saying with his words of truth was that I know who you are. Remember, he always says, I know your deeds. And that should be both encouraging and challenging at the same time. I know you. I know where you live. And he says this, I know that you live where Satan's throne is, where Satan dwells. That's what he says. You live in the city of Satan. This is worse than the city of sin, people. I mean, this is like, he's saying, you live where, where the devil lives, man. And why would he say that? Well, primarily it's because there is an imperial cult there, a cultic worship around the emperor who claims to be Lord of Lords and God of Gods. And this is what should be so encouraging for us even in this moment in human history, fam, is that no matter where we are, God knows exactly where we are. He knows what time we're in. He knows exactly what we're facing. He knows. And that was the encouragement. I know you. I know your deeds. I know that you have not denied my faith. You haven't said, God, Jesus is not God. You haven't said that, that he didn't die on that cross. You haven't denied your faith. You have held strong even in the face of persecution. In fact, one of my faithful witness, Antipas, actually gave his life as a martyr. So this church has been through some things. The encouragement is that they didn't deny their faith. The encouragement is that just like you and I, that Jesus knew exactly their situation. Some of us feel like, man, there's just no way. Like, if you really knew what, we, what I was dealing with, maybe you'd have a different opinion of me. Here's the good news, is that Jesus already knows what you and I are dealing with, what we're thinking, what we've said or done, what we are going to say or do. And he has made a decision, and that decision is to love us anyway. So the problem wasn't that the church and the Christians in Pergamum were denying their faith. It's that they were compromising it. They were compromising it by adding a little bit to it. It was, like a, it was kind of like a Jesus plus kind of a situation. While they believed, they compromised. This is what I, I mean. And, in verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who would hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So, who's Balaam? Who's Balak? Nicola who? Right? We've got to unpack some of these things. So, remember ba do you remember Balaam? Now, Balaam was a prophet in the Old Testament. You can find his story in Numbers 22 through 25. And it's this moment where Israel is moving through the land. And he comes into the land of a king named Balak. And Balak is kind of freaking out. He's like, this whole giant swarm of people is coming into my land. My, all of my people are freaking out. They're terrified. So he hires a prophet for hire, a, a, someone who's going to bless you're going to pay him money, he's going to give you a prophetic word. You're going to pay him money, he's going to tell you you're blessed, or he's going to curse someone that you don't like. So he calls on Balaam. So Balaam is not a, a hero. He's not a noble guy. He's like a spiritual mercenary. He comes in and he blesses, right? Or he curses, depending on how much you pay him. 
funny thing was, is every time Balak said, go on this, this hill, overlook Israel, and I want you to curse them, what came out of his mouth was a blessing instead of a curse. It was like every single time God intervened in this, the life of this pagan who was out for selfish gain, and instead of cursing Israel, he actually blessed them. Balak's getting all frustrated. Balaam, with, with an amazing amount of discernment, I don't even know if he knows, but he's saying, look, I can only say what God has told me to say, and this is what God has told me to say. Okay, well, then they get blessed. So what, what happened? Well, the Israelites didn't get cursed by Balaam. They got compromised. And what Jesus is saying here and what happened in Numbers 22 was that the Israelites didn't deny Yahweh. They didn't deny that God was the God of the, the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke. They, they didn't deny that Yahweh, that I am, that God. They just added some other things to him. So they added food sacrifice to idols. They added uh, sexual immorality, some, some practices of worship to other gods. They added intermarrying with people that God had strictly forbidden them to intermarry with. So it wasn't that they said, we don't believe in Yahweh anymore. They said, no, 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 Yahweh plus a little bit of this. Yahweh plus. And it enticed their hearts away from the true God. And then they begin to worship idols. And then here comes the, here comes the judgment. Here comes the brokenness again. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a cycle that happens so often throughout the Bible, really throughout our whole life. And in the same way it was Yahweh plus for the Old Testament Israelites, it was Jesus plus for these Christians in Pergamum. Because it was Jesus plus maybe the emperor. Now, not everybody started doing emperor worship, but there were probably some Christians that were like, you know what, in order to get ahead, in order to, to make life a little bit easier, sure, sure, Jesus, yes. So I'll take also a little bit of incense and I'll throw it on the altar and sure, all hail Caesar, Lord of lords, Jesus plus. Jesus plus Demeter. I mean, if you needed a, a good harvest, Demeter was the god of the harvest. So God is the Lord of lords. He's like the big, big guy. He's like the macro God. But, but maybe maybe there's some Jesus plus in this. Maybe we need a little bit of extra, you know, some specific gods. Well, I don't necessarily need a God that's like God of all the gods. Maybe I just need a God that's like over harvest. And so I'm going to hit up Demeter. I'm going to worship him too. I'm not going to deny Jesus, but Jesus plus. Jesus plus Athena. I need a little bit of wisdom. Never mind that the Holy Spirit is the, is the revealer of truth, the, the, he's the comforter, that he is the very spirit and wisdom of God. But no, 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 Jesus plus Athena, the God of wisdom. Jesus plus Dionysus, celebrate. I just need to party and I need a God that likes to party too. Well, that's Dionysus. Jesus plus. So now, even though, man, following Jesus may be a little bit rigid, but Dionysus, now I can celebrate, get a little drunk, eat a little bit more food, hook up with some temple prostitutes, booyah! Now we're, in, now we're in it. Now we're enjoying life to the fullest. Maybe this is what Jesus meant when he said abundant life. Jesus plus. Jesus plus a Celepius, a Celepius the God of medicine. Jesus is no longer the healer. See, the church had a very real struggle a really, very real spiritual battle going on, and so do we. It's the battle for who we will believe. It is. It's a struggle for who we're going to place our trust in. Who is the author and finisher of our faith, our life, our beliefs, our identity? Who will we worship? Self? Jesus. Who will we believe? What are we going to choose to believe about our identity? Is, is my identity something that I individually construct based on what I feel and my own self-revelation? Is that my identity? Is my identity primarily determined by maybe my desires, whether they be physical, sexual, emotional? Like, is that, like, is that the center of my identity? Or 
Is my identity rooted in who Jesus calls me, his child, his bride? Interesting word, bride. In fact, the word Pergamum actually has the root word for married. Remember, we are the bride of Christ. That's our identity too. Will we trust it? Will, what will I believe about God's word? Is it completely subjective? Can I pick and choose what the word of God is saying and how I'm to live my life? Is it an errant? Or are there a few things that I can just kind of, eh, I mean, it matters, fam. What will we hold on to? How will we hold on to Christian conviction while living out the compassion of Christ that we're called to in the culture and the time that we're in? The same questions that the Christians in Pergamum would have been asking, we need to be asking too. Will we compromise to avoid suffering or to achieve success? Will we compromise with a Jesus plus kind of faith? Jesus plus politics. Jesus plus power. Jesus plus whatever idol I might be worshiping. Maybe it's Jesus plus my strategy. Cool, if I could just get the right strategy, revival's guaranteed. Jesus plus my creativity. If, it could just, if I could just be more creative, Jesus plus my money. If we could just pull enough things together, Jesus plus. There's a thing about faith. <laughs> There's a thing about following Jesus is that it's not Jesus plus, it's Jesus only. It's Jesus only. In Christ alone. See, if the devil can't convert you, he'll compromise you. If he can't convert you, he'll compromise you. Zeus, the god of gods, the top dog in the Roman pantheon of gods. He was the lord of lords. If you needed power, you want, you want Zeus on your side. And maybe this is why they begin to mention the Nicolaitans, because the Nicolaitans, actually two words in that word, Nicolaitans actually make up the meaning to conquer the laity. So you had this, this, these teachings within the body of Christ where people were dominating, they were lording, they were uh, leaning heavy on authority, they were increasing the divide between the clergy and the laity, between the professional church staff and the members of the church itself. Jesus plus. Jesus plus my education. Jesus plus my understanding of theology. Jesus plus my calling and my anointing. What ended up happening was they were leaning on power in order to persuade. They were using dominance in order to move their agenda forward. And the God who holds the seven stars in his hand, who has a double-edged sword protruding from his mouth, speaking truth, is cutting through those lies and saying this, don't compromise. Don't compromise, church. So the devil can't compromise, can't convert us, he'll compromise us. Now, Jesus' warning is clear. He's saying, be more worried about the sword in my mouth, the sword of my mouth, the authority that I have. Be more worried about my sword than the sword of Rome. And he says that, therefore, repent. If not, I'm going to come to you soon, and I'm going to war against them with the sword of my mouth. This is the second time just within this church and this portion of the letter, second time that he's said those images, those words, sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's lean in. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except for the one who receives it. 
So what do, we, what do they have to do? How do they get back on track? Jesus always, the prophetic heart of Jesus is this. He never just points out problems without pointing us to the solution. It's usually just bringing us right back to the heart of Jesus. And so he says this, repent. Repent. Humble yourself. Turn away from what you're doing and believing. Go 180 degrees, the opposite direction. Turn towards Jesus. And in this case, repent of compromise. Repent of the Jesus plus faith. Repent of depending on anything or anyone other than Jesus himself. Here's the second thing he says. He will give the hidden manna. Here's what I would encourage. Number one, repent. Number two, feed on God's word. Feed on it, family. Feed on God's word. In, in New Hope, what we've said for years and years is daily devotions. You doing your daily devotion? We've developed resources to make sure that doing your daily devotions, reading the word of God and allowing the word of God to actually read us daily, that every single day we have an appointment with the king of kings, not Zeus, not Rome, but the one who holds the church in his hand the one who calls us children, the one who calls us bride. It's Jesus. That's why daily devotions are so important. The point isn't that we become so the most disciplined people in our family, that we become the most disciplined people in our church or on the block. It is that we become so hungry to feed on the very word of God, the double-edged sword of truth that Jesus is coming right out of his mouth that we have the opportunity every single day to initiate relationship and pursue him. And what I love about this passage is he says, I will give you to the one who conquers. If you listen, if you repent, what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you hidden manna. What was manna? Do you remember? Manna was that, that wafer-like substance, right? It was the daily provision for the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. Daily provision. So they could just keep enough for the day. They didn't keep enough for the week or the month. It would go rotten. What they did is every day God would provide manna for them, just what they needed for the day. It was also a practice in depending on God every single day of their life. The power of daily devotions for you and me will radically change our life. The power of daily devoting our heart and our time to getting to know Jesus through his word. In times of prayer, in times of worship, devotion moments of stillness before God, thinking on his word. powerful. And what's powerful is that it's hidden manna too. Do you notice that? I'll give him hidden manna. Meaning what? Meaning it's not just out there. It means that there's going to need to be an effort on their part to find what is hidden. There's treasure to be discovered. The good news is we have the map. It's not something that we're going to go blindly out and find. Hidden manna treasure that Jesus has for us when we feed on the Word of God to anchor our heart and ourselves in the truth of God's Word. And then he says this, I'm going to give him a white stone. And white stones were often used as a vote of an acquittal for someone that was on trial to set them free. It was also often used as a ticket of entry into feasts. And so what's crazy is that on that white stone, he says that there is an, there's an, it's really cool, there's a name on that stone. But it's not a name that everyone's going to know. It's a name that God writes on the stone and gives to this individual. And the only people, the only two people who know what that name is, is God himself and the person who receives the stone. Family, there's like, there's an intimacy here. There's, it's not just rigid, cold, hard facts about truth and about God. There's a living, breathing power in the love of Jesus. 
when we focus on his words of love and truth. It's alive. The word of God is alive. It's power, sharper than any two-edged sword, rightly dividing, rightly dividing between deception and truth. Rightly dividing between my agenda and his. But here's the thing, fam. If the devil can't convert us, he'll try and compromise us. And often he will start in the place, if he can, if he can remove our foundation, we will find ourselves on sinking sand. Now, we live in a culture of fluid truth. We live in a, basically in a, in a secularized culture where state, absolute statements of truth are discouraged. They're not, they're not believed. It's subjective oftentimes. It's what we feel. It's, it's what we determine. It's what we self-determine as our story or our truth. You'll hear that word as well. If you would let me speak my truth, things like that. We're in a, we're in a really crazy moment in human history. It's not that we haven't experienced these things before, but they're happening at unprecedented levels because also the access to technology is so wild that these competing truth claims about who God is or who God isn't, who Jesus was, it was even real. Is the Bible real or is it just a bunch of made-up fairy tales? All of these things all happening 24 hours a day, every day of the week, every week of the year. And you and I have to decide if we are going to lean in, if we have an ear to hear, are we going to listen to Jesus? This was the challenge to the church at Pergamum. It was going to be challenging to them in the future because what was to come, starting in chapter 4, 5, and 6, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, was going to matter to them. And it matters to us today. Family, I would say that we need to be so solid on, on the essentials of truth and the essentials of our faith. So no matter what comes our way, we will stand confident in what we know to be truth. That's why I value the Word of God. That's why I love the Bible. That's why reading it and meditating on it and being challenged by it is so, so important. Because it won't be just by my own sheer will that I won't compromise. I mean, I'm weak, fam. I'm limited as a human. It will be the power of Jesus in me, giving me the ability to hold on to what I know is true and seeing even how, the, how he can use it far beyond what I understand. I was reading a story about a man who had a conversation with a pastor in the former Soviet Union. And this pastor was saying that Stalin's reign at the time was just so severe. In fact, this pastor had two KGB agents come up to him and basically say, hey, look, we'll take care of you. You stay the pastor of this church, but once a week, give us a report on every one of these Christians, once a week. Work for us. Come on. The pastor says, I can't do that. I can't do it, God, and I can't do that to this church. So there was a cost. He didn't compromise, but he did pay a cost. They put him in a labor camp in Siberia for something like 10 years. So they send him to this prison camp. He endures forced labor. But it's crazy how God even used this. Even the cost of comfort, even the fairness being thrown out the window. Here's what happened. Because he was a carpenter, he built towns for Stalin. And so they'd go out in these 60-mile radiuses, and there they would fellowship with other Christians. They found actually Christians in the labor camps, but then they would go into these towns, and they would fellowship with other Christians. And for 10 years, they would do that. Now today, there are hundreds of churches in Siberia as a result of the small prisoner fellowships, these small groups that were formed. See, when people refuse to compromise, they might lose a lot. We might lose a lot. But what we gain in Christ is so much more. It's amazing that 
what we feel we might be limited by when we stand on things that we believe, how it limits us. But in fact, God's going to use it to blow our minds. Moments where we feel like our rights are being violated or moments where we feel like this, this situation is so unfair. But as we don't compromise our character in Christ, as we don't compromise on the essentials that matter in Christ, as we don't live a Jesus plus faith, we, we live a Jesus only faith. I think we'll be blown away at the ways in which God actually uses our limitations to show just how unlimited he really is. Family, if the devil can't convert us, he'll try and compromise us. So let's feed on the very word of God so that we know the solid ground on which we stand. Family, let's, let's stand on the truth of God's word. Let's have a humility and, and repent of any way we've been depending on anything other than Jesus alone. And let's feed daily on the Word of God to know Him better, to know ourselves better, to know one another better. God bless you, family. Have an incredible week. I'm praying for you, and I'm excited to see you this Sunday 9 a.m. God bless you, New Hope.
Yeah.